Anyways, Bart Ehrman, he, he's a fascinating fellow because his narrow range of expertise is in textual criticism. He has left that field and now is doing the church history thing. But even there, he gets involved in theology every once in a while. And people just go, well, if you're an expert in the early development of the Alexandrian text type, you must be an expert in everything. As long as you're an unbeliever. Anyways. And so he writes an article, Is Paul at Odds with Matthew? And he's talking about Paul and his op opponents in Galatia. And he says, Paul was incensed, this interpretation of the faith and assisted with extraordinary vehemence that was completely wrong. The Gentile followers of Jesus were not, absolutely not, supposed to become Jewish. Anyone who thought so rendered the death of Jesus worthless. It was only that death and the resurrection that made a person right with God, nothing else, certainly not following Torah. Well, that was part of it. Anyway, I often wonder whether Paul and the author of the Gospel of Matthew would have gotten along. Matthew's Gospel is probably written about 30 years after Paul. He, put, he puts Matthew uh, in between 80 and 85. Uh, I certainly would not put that far back, but of course, we're talking about Bart Ehrman here. Uh, Matthew, like the other gospel writers, did not produce his account simply out of antiquarian interest to inform his readers what happened 55 years earlier in the days of Jesus. He is not a disinterested biography or an objective history. It is a gospel. In other words, it is intended to proclaim the good news about Jesus and the salvation that he brings. When Jesus teaches something in his gospel, Matthew expects the teaching to be relevant to his readers, and they will want to do what Jesus says. There is no doubt that Matthew would agree with Paul that it was the death and resurrection of Jesus that brought salvation to the world. The gospel is not entirely about Jesus' death and resurrection, but it is largely about that. It is 28 chapters long, and at least eight chapters are focused exclusively on what happened during the last week of Jesus' life in Jerusalem, including the crucifixion and resurrection. This is clearly the climax of the story. And for Matthew, and as for his predecessor Mark, the death of Jesus is seen as a ransom for many. It is through his death that he will save his people from their sins, Matthew 1.21. So, Paul would agree, so Matthew would agree with Paul here, but so would Paul's opponents in Galatia. The controversy with the Galatian opposition was not over whether Jesus' death brings salvation. It was over whether the followers of Jesus who accept that death need to keep the Jewish law. Well, uh, immediately, we see how surface level Ehrman's understanding of the theology of the New Testament is, the background of the New Testament, uh, the book of Galatians itself. Again, being a textual critical scholar does not make you a theologian by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, just, just It just doesn't. And so uh, it, it wasn't a matter of needing to keep the Jewish law. It was whether you had to enter into the covenant via circumcision and that whether the covenant promises were limited to those who first entered into that covenant and then it was just for them afterwards. And this is why you had the separation between Jews and Gentiles when the people from James came. It wasn't just a keeping the whole thing. Now, Paul's argument is going to be, if you keep one part, you're going to have to keep the whole thing. But that's just because his opponents were, being, were picking and choosing which part of the law had to continue to be kept in making you right before God by making circumcision prior to. It isn't faith alone that saves. That's only available to a person who first obeys these things. Which, wow, sounds a whole lot like the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine of investigative judgment. But anyway, I digress. I continue on with Ehrman. And it does seem to me that this is where Paul and Matthew split company. Again, remember that when Matthew decides what to present about Jesus' life in the gospel, it is not simply so that people can know what really happened in the past, is so that the life and teachings of Jesus can direct the lives of his followers in the present. And what does Jesus say about the Jewish law in Matthew? He says that his followers have to keep it. One of the key passages is something that you will never find in the writings of Paul. And then he quotes, not suppose I came to destroy the law, the prophets came not to destroy it, but to fulfill, etc., etc. Um, again, totally misunderstanding how often Paul said exactly that. I mean, right in the middle of proclaiming justification by faith in Romans chapter 3, what does he say? Do we therefore nullify the law? No, we establish the law. And then he explains what the purpose of the law is. I mean, it, 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 it's just amazing how the, the opponents of the Christian faith, especially in this area, have such surface-level arguments. It, it, 
at least go and grab some good new perspectivist stuff and throw it at us. It's not like we haven't heard that before either, but um, it just shows, shows such a incredibly shallow understanding of New Testament, of the, of the whole state of New Testament studies right now. And that shouldn't shock us because Ehrman's last book was about the various views of Jesus on the part of the uh, authors of the New Testament. And he, he confessed in that book about how he had had major changes in his understanding of things just in the study and writing of that book. And the stuff he came to understand was basic, simplistic stuff, stuff that, I'm sorry, anybody who calls themselves any kind of New Testament scholar should have known this stuff a long time ago. And he's changed since then. A lot of people would applaud him. Yay, you've changed since then. I mean, he's now said on his blog that all the gospel writers consider Jesus to be divine in some fashion. Everyone, it used to be his view was, oh, no, 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 Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they didn't believe in, in, in Jesus being divine anyway. It's just John. Now he says they all did on different levels, but they all did. They all viewed him. Uh, in fact, to all, all my Muslim friends out there, um, if, if you're still using Bart Ehrman, you're not even understanding what Bart Ehrman is currently saying, which is a shame, but not overly surprising. Um, so he's even changed since then. Uh, so I, I just, why does the world give such weight to what this man says? I mean, the books that he's written, just the, the, the books that are the most popular are just that. They're popular level books. Especially when it comes to theology, New Testament history, so on and so forth. Um, and so, uh, I really don't think Matthew's Jesus did not mean what he says. He gives no hint that following the law this closely is impossible to do. He seems to think it is possible. God gave a law. You should follow it scrupulously even more scrupulously than the righteous scribes and Pharisees. If you don't, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, again, amazing even interpretations of Matthew. Um, not, and again, you can, you can make any of the New Testament writers say almost anything you want as long as you can separate them from one, one another. There, there is no New Testament theology. You can't, you, you can't have Matthew and Mark and Luke or you can't, you know, it's it's easy to come up with any type of theology as long as you can atomize the text of the New Testament. And Ehrman's been doing, been making a lot of money uh, off of that for a very, very long time. But none of this shows any serious understanding of Paul's view of the law, the concept of good works, any of these things. Uh, the concept of the law as our schoolmaster bring us into Christ. Doesn't, doesn't even worry himself with such things. Uh, you're just you're just feeding the flock. Uh, with with this feeding the feeding the people who want to hear you say what you you've got to say